All right. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be back. You know, they always say it's one thing to be invited to preach, but it's another thing to be invited back. So uh, appreciate that. Um, great, great joy. Great pleasure uh, to be with y'all this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, um, and as I begin, I'd like to uh, uh, just take a moment and pray the Lord and uh, pray to the Lord and ask for his help. And so would you just uh, lift up your hearts to God as we ask for a blessing. Lord, how great you are. Lord, we so much going on in each of our lives individually, so much going on in our nation. Lord, a heart breaks for our brothers and sisters in Christ and in Sutherland Springs, Lord. And it seems just uh, such senseless evil, Lord, but we have this eternal hope that one day when we see your face that it will all make sense. So we ask for a profound comfort for the families there. And even this weekend as we remember uh, our veterans, Lord, we acknowledge how kind and merciful you have been and how un- incredibly gracious to us that we even live in this country where we experience so much blessing, so much freedom that most in the world don't even know. And I pray that we would never take that for granted. And now, Lord, I ask for your special help as I open this word. I ask for grace to speak, and I ask for grace for all of us to hear from you. We ask that you would speak from heaven and minister to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, would you please turn with me to Romans chapter 6. As you turn there, I'd like to share a little bit about um, a man. It's a man I know, a man that I care about deeply, a, a, a man no one, no one in here knows, a man who I believe uh, knows the Lord, and the Lord knows him. Uh, but this man had a secret, a secret sin. Uh, that no one knew about for many, many years. But one day, his sin was found out. Brothers and sisters in Christ, your sin will always find you out. And praise the Lord, when his sin was found out, he repented. But all those years... We, you know, how, we always wondered how could he have done that for all those years. And one of the ways that he salved his conscience, that he numbed his conscience, was that he told himself that he was, he told himself that he was covered by the blood. That God's grace is so great, so kind, so merciful. That he was covered by the blood that surely this would be okay. And, of course, we know that that's, it's not right. But yet, if we think about what Paul preached about the grace of God and really how free God's grace is, how undeserving we are of God's grace, how we are so lost in our sin and how merciful God is to reach down and pluck us up totally, totally without regard for, for anything that we've done in spite of what we've done. God shows mercy to us. I think if we really understand how great the grace of God is, we will have to ask the question that people asked of Paul. A question that we're going to try to answer today. From Romans chapter 6. And if you would, would you please stand in honor of the reading of the word of God. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. The word of God. You may be seated. So the question is, is if we are really saved by grace and not by works, if this is true, (laughs) then why not sin that grace may abound? If God's mercy... Is, is, is shown to be great precisely because he saves people who don't deserve it, then don't we then have the freedom, shouldn't we even sin even more, in fact, so that God's grace will look even better? And Paul gives two interlocked, interdependent answers to this question and, 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 and their application. Two interlocked, interdependent answers to this question to this question and their application. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The first answer that Paul gives is no, because we have died to sin. No, because we have died to sin. What does he say? He says, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So how does Paul answer this question that people are raising against him? And he's saying that he answers by referring to baptism. Right. So what is baptism? All right. We're we're good Baptists in here. Right. And so. You know, we're not into that, you know, little, little sprinkle. I mean, you, we got to get under, right? We got we to gotta get totally underneath. Why? <laughs> why? Why is that such, such a big deal? Well, it's because that we believe as Baptists that the symbol, the symbol has profound significance. That, the, that, the physical act, that what is symbolized by the physical act of going underneath the water and being lifted up speaks to profound theological truth and reality that has happened in your life. We are saying that when a person is baptized and you're, you're dunked underneath the water, you, you are proclaiming to the world when you're being baptized, you are proclaiming to the world that you have died. That you're in effect being buried in a watery grave. You have died with Christ and that you have been raised to walk in the newness of of life. That is that you are telling the world, that's what baptism is. You're, you're telling the world that a real internal change has happened in your life. That's what we believe that baptism is. So we don't believe that there's, is there some kind of special act or some kind of, a mir- you know, quote unquote, miracle or special thing that takes place in the act of baptism. We believe that it is a testimony of something that has already happened in your heart. You are saying that a, that your old self is dead, that a new self is alive in you, you have a new identity. You've been changed. So what Paul is saying is that grace then, the grace of God doesn't mean license to sin because he's telling his opponents because you don't even understand what we're talking about. You don't even understand about Christian conversion. A Christian is someone who not just shouldn't sin, but a Christian is someone who can't sin because a fundamental change has taken place in their heart. 
The, the definition of a Christian is someone who has died to sin and has been raised to new life in Christ. And so Paul points these people back to their baptism. He says, haven't you been baptized? Don't you know what you were saying when you were baptized? You were telling the world that you died to sin. Well, how can you live, to, how can you live for sin like you've never died to it? Was your baptism just a fluke? Was it just, was it just a lie? Was it just, were you, are you an imposter? What is it? He points them back and say, how can you say if you've died to sin, how can you say that, how can you continue to live in it? You see, it's totally, something can totally different. So, how does this work? How does, how does dying, dying to, to, to sin in Christ actually work, and, and how does it change our lives? Well, Paul gives us a little more detail in verses 5 through 7. He says, if we have been united with, with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. So what he's saying is that in, when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus Christ, you are joined with him by faith. You become one with him. He becomes, your, he becomes your head. You become his body. And in effect, when you are joined with Christ, it was as if when he died on the cross, you died. And when he rose from the dead, you rose from the dead. It's a real reality that has taken place in our hearts. And what Paul is saying is that, so see, we live in fallen natures. We live in sinful bodies. This is important to understand because there's lots of people today who are going to basically say, well, you know, pe- people are basically good. Well, if people are basically good, why do we have all the problems that we have? If people are basically good, why, is, why are there so many broken relationships? If people are basically good, why is there so much evil rampant in the world? If, if people are basically good, that means it should be easier to love people than to get frustrated with them, right? Is that reality? No, it's not reality. You don't have to teach an infant to sin. Anyone ever notice that? You don't have to teach a baby to, to, to lie. You don't have to teach a baby to, to, to be angry, to be selfish, to want to be the boss. They know how to do that. You have to teach them how to tell the truth. You have to teach them how to obey. Because why? Because the Bible says that we have, we have fallen natures, that we as humans are not, we are less Because of sin, we are less than what we're supposed to be. That's what your view of humanity, your view of the way, what it means to be human, actually affects lots of things in your life. And what, and the Bible says that this is inherited from Adam. We inherit this from Adam through our, through the body. And so we have fallen bodies that, that have deceitful desire. And this is important because Because we have fallen natures, that means that the natural inclination of our heart is going to be to sin. That means that you can't trust yourself. So today, there's people today that say, well, if I have a certain desire, then that desire must be who I am. And who are you to tell me that I can't embrace this desire? But if you understand the Bible, you know that that logic's totally wrong because the Bible says because you are fallen, then, then by definition, you, at many times you are going to have desires that are wrong. You are going to have desires that are going to tell you to do something that God says is wrong, that are going to in the end destroy you. So we can't trust ourselves. And it, these things are in our body. It's in our sin nature. Well, when then are we rid? When do we rid ourselves of our sin nature? When do we finally rid ourselves of our sin nature? When we die. When we die, we become rid of our sin nature. Well, the Bible says that when you un unite with Christ through faith, then in essence, you receive a down payment now in this life of the future freedom from sin that you'll uh, receive at the end. In other words, when you, you die with Christ now, not just when you actually die, but you die with Christ now so that you receive a down payment on the freedom from sin that you will one day fully receive when your old self is put off and your new self is put on. You see it? Because we have a fallen nature, that's why we have the hope of eternal life 
That is that God will actually give us new bodies that are free from sin. Well, why do we need new bodies? Because our present ones are broken. Anyone, anyone can tell that your body's broken? Anyone can tell your body's not the way it's supposed to be? That's why we need new ones. But the Bible says that we receive a down payment now through faith in Christ. When we die with Christ, that means that whereas before slave was, sin was your master and you were its slave, now a fundamental change has taken place. You have died with Christ. You have been raised to new life so that now sin is still in your body, but it doesn't rule you. You rule it. Sin doesn't rule you. You rule it if you're a Christian. If the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. And so being a Christian is more than just an act of the will. It's more than just someone who seems to have some kind of external Christian morality. And that's true. This is important. This is essential. You can have all the trappings of Christianity but not be a true Christian. Because what is Paul saying? The essence of Christianity is it. You can take fruit to, you can take apples to an orange tree, but that doesn't change what kind of tree it is. What, what, what Paul is saying is that the essence of Christianity is not first an ethical system, although it is. The essence of Christianity is first a change in identity. It's first being, you're having your old self crucified and your new self being resurrected, and then you live out who God, you live out your new identity. It's something, it's something totally different. So we don't reach up to God. God, in his grace, he reaches down to us, and he's given us spiritual life, and now our bodies just have to catch up. So can we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, no. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Have you, have you, so it begs the question, have you really died to sin? Has there been a time in your life when a fundamental change has taken place in your heart? Now, we still battle sin. We all know that. But if you can't point to any actual change where you begin to hate your sin and begin to want God, even though obedience was a struggle, you hated your sin and began to want to obey God, and you grew, and you were growing in your faith and love and obedience, if if a change like that's never happened, then maybe you've never been born again. So the answer then is to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot continue in sin Because we have died with Christ. But Paul gives another answer. And I said at the beginning that a second answer was interdependent and interlocking with the first. We can't continue in sin because we have died died with Christ. But neither, we can't continue with sin either because we have been raised with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. Look in verses 8 through 10. Paul says, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him, for the death he died to sin, he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Back in verse 4, which we read earlier, he says that we were buried with him uh, by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So go back to the illustration of baptism. When, when, when someone is baptized, you, praise the Lord, you don't just dunk them and just you stay there, you know? You, you, you pick them back. Now, some people you want to hold under there a little bit longer <laughs> to, to make sure it takes, okay? But then eventually you got to pick them back up, all right? So, so when you die, when you die, you can't... You don't just die to your sin so that you just do nothing. You, you don't, you're not crucified with Christ for no purpose. You're crucified for a reason, for an end. You are cru- your old self has died. You die to sin so that you can live for Christ. The two always go together. Death and resurrection always go together. They're interlocking. They're interdependent. They always go together. In the same way that we have died with Christ, that we testify in, with that in baptism... We also are saying that we have been raised to new life in Christ. That a new, a new life has been born in us. That we are, we are not only freed from sin, but we're free to live for God. Uh, in, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul said these very famous verses. He said, For through the law I died to the law, 
so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see, Paul is testifying in his own life. I died to the law. I was crucified with Christ. And now, Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Do you see that? Christ died. Uh, Paul died. Paul died. The old Paul died. And then a new Paul was raised to life within him. A Christ Paul, Paul Christ, a Christian Paul, came to life in the place of the old Paul who died. And now he's different. Why is Paul different? He, we, we talked about it a couple weeks ago when I preached here a couple weeks ago. No, if you want a testimony of a changed life, look at the Apostle Paul. He was killing Christians, and then he became the boldest proclaimer of the gospel the world has ever known. What happened to him? Well, this is what he says happened to him. I died, and now Christ is alive in me. And that's what it means to be a Christian. So if Christ lives in you, can you continue to walk in sin? If Christ lives in you, can you live as if that doesn't make a difference? No. So deliverance from sin is a twofold process. We must die so that we can live. Jesus, in his death and resurrection, he, he both paid the penalty for sin. So remember, the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. God told Adam and Eve, when you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die when you rebel against God that earns death but but Christ through his death and resurrection he he paid the penalty for sin with his death and then he conquered the penalty for sin with his resurrection so it takes both it takes both death and resurrection to conquer sin and that's what Jesus did so in our conversion which we testify in baptism we are saying that we have died and that our new self has become spiritually alive. Do you feel it? Do you feel that spiritual life? Do you feel, do you feel, that, do you feel that Holy Spirit living within you that's guiding you? That, that when you read the scriptures, it makes the word come alive? It makes you see things that you've never saw before. It causes you to love people you would never love otherwise. It causes you to give that you'd never give otherwise. You feel it? You feel the life of Christ in you? Because Jesus has paid the penalty for sin and conquered the penalty for sin, all that remains for those who believe is eternal life. Because I live, you also will live. So can we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says no, because we have died to sin, and no, because we have been raised with Christ. No, because we've died to sin, and no, because we have been raised with Christ. So, how does... What Paul is saying actually apply to our lives. How do we actually take hold of it and make it work for us so that we are overcoming sin in our life? He tells us in verses 11 through 14. Paul says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So what's Paul saying? In verse 11, he says that you must, you must consider yourself dead to sin... And alive to God in Christ Jesus. You must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This, this word, consider, it's, it's in, the, in the original language, it's, a, it's in the imperative mood. In other words, it's a command. It's not, it's not a suggestion. Paul is at, He's telling the, the Roman believers, he's telling them, he is commanding them. He is saying, consider, think, count yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. Now this, this, this word, count or consider, is the same word that is used in lots of places in the New Testament when it says that God 
counts to us righteousness, counts to us the righteousness of Christ apart from works. That God counts to uh, counts Jesus' when we believe in Christ and become one with him, that God counts Jesus' righteousness as if it was our own. That's, what, that's the essence of salvation. That when God looks on us, because we are in Christ, God looks at us and sees Christ. And he considers in his mind that Christ's righteousness is our righteousness, that Christ's death was our death, that Christ's life is our life. And if God thinks something is true, my friends, it's true. Because God determines reality. That's how, that's how that word count is used. But that same word, Paul's telling you and me to say the same word, count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Consider yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. What does that mean? It means that, it means that the natural tendency of your heart is to, to believe things that are not true. And sin and the devil and your sinful flesh are going to come at you in an hour of temptation and tell you, look, you, you can't escape this. You can't get rid, you can't, you can't be nice to that person who just cut you off or flipped you off. You can't love your spouse who you're really angry at right now. You can't give to this person who doesn't deserve it. It will tell you all those things, and, you're going, and if you listen to it, you're going to believe it. But Paul is saying, look, you're dead to that. And if you, can, if you continue to live as if you're a slave to sin, then you're living a lie because you're not living the truth. You're like a... You're like a a prisoner who refuses to leave an unlocked cell if you continue in sin as a Christian. Because the Bible says you've been set free and you refuse to believe it. The Bible says sin will have no dominion over you. It will not rule over you. But if you still submit yourself, that's what, he, that's what Paul's talking about. He says, don't present your members to, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. What does that mean? It means that. Our, he's, our members, he's already talking about our body. He's talking about our body parts. Every day, every day you will be faced with decisions where your body and what you do with your body, you will present it, your body, as an instrument. Either you'll present it for sin to do sin's bidding or you'll present your body to God to do God's bidding. And every day you have to decide whose slave you're going to be. Jesus said... Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Christ is a far better master than sin. And if you, if you, if you submit yourself to the, to, the, to the yoke of sin, it's going to destroy you. But if you submit to the yoke of... Think about, think about what Jesus just said. Jesus is the only master that when you become his slave, you get rest. It's restful for your soul. You're either a slave to sin, Paul says, or a slave to God. Sin has no dominion over you. So what do you have to do? You have to believe it. You have to live it. It's a battle in your heart and in your mind. It's a battle for the truth. You know, one of the most important things that God teaches us to do is to think about how we think. Lots of times... Our mind, our mind runs off in these crazy things or, or people who just really struggle, maybe they struggle with depression or anxiety because their, their mind, they can't stop thinking about these things that, that make them worried or anxious and things like that. And God says, look, your mind is controlling you. You have to take control of your mind. Fill your mind with God to push out everything else. Fill your mind with Christ. Control your thoughts. You can choose what you think about. You can choose what you believe. Now, your, your, sins, your, your body's going to tell you lies, but Paul is saying, you consider, you think, you act, you choose to say no. Tell your sin no. Tell it no. Say, t- do it out loud if you have to, if that's what it takes. Say, look, you're dead to me, and I'm dead to you. You don't rule me anymore. It's a battle for your soul, but... God says that if you are a Christian, you have died to sin. 
and you are alive in Christ Jesus. So what is the point in all of this? The point is, is that lots of people have Christianity backwards. Lots of people, when you talk about Christianity, I just heard an illustration this week. Uh, uh, but uh, of people, and they'll say, you know, talk, you talk about Christianity with them, they'll say, well, when I become a Christian, I want to be a really good Christian. When I become a Christian, I'm going to do it right. But I'm just not, I know I'm not kind of living the way I am should right now. But, but so one day, one day when I, can, when I get my act together, I'm going to be a really good Christian. They don't understand. It's a total misunderstanding of Christianity. God nowhere says, God nowhere says, clean yourself up, then come to me. God says, come to me and I'll clean you up. God, and even when you're a Christian, God never asks you to do something you can't do. You know, sometimes, I think, I think sometimes we as Christians are in error when we look out in a sinful world at unbelievers and we expect unbelievers to act like Christians. They can't. Without the Holy Spirit of God, it's impossible to be a Christian. But the Bible says when you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit of God has entered into your heart, then God never asks you to do something that he doesn't, he, that he, he's not going to ask you to be something other than who you are. That's why when God comes in, he gives you a new identity. He comes in and he puts your old self to death and gives you new life in Christ. He makes you somebody new. And then he says, now be who you are. Then he says, now be who I've just recreated you to be. Christ comes into your life. He adopts you into his his kingdom. You become a child of the living God. And now he says, now be who you are. God never asks you to be something other than you are. He comes in. He changes you. And then he says, now be who you are. Wilfredo Garza lived the life of an illegal immigrant for more than 35 years. Year after year, he eked out a living crossing the border from Mexico to the U.S., some days finding work, some days not. Regardless, he was constantly looking over his shoulder. He was caught by Border Patrol four times and then bussed back to Mexico. Undeterred by each apprehension, he swam back across the Rio Grande to try again. The cycle would have continued for several more years if not for an amazing... Discovery, one day, Wilfredo worked up the courage to talk to an immigration lawyer. There, he found out that his father was born in Texas and spent time working there, which meant that Wilfredo was a U.S. citizen. All these years, he possessed the very papers, his father's birth certificate and work records, that proved that he was a citizen, and yet he lived in guilt and fear. Now he doesn't have to creak a sneak across the border. He walks through the gate. Paul, in Philippians 3, says our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the same power with which he subjects all things to himself. We, we, the Bible says, are citizens of of another kingdom, another world. We're subjects of another king. That's who we are. Now we just have to live it. And as I close this morning, I'll just extend an invitation. Maybe this morning, someone in this room can say, that's never happened to me. I've never been brought from death to life. I, 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 can't, I can't battle sin in my life because I don't even want to. But maybe this morning you have seen the glory of Jesus Christ who came and who died for you and who rose from the dead for you so that if you take hold of him by faith this morning, you can become a son or daughter of the eternal and everlasting God. And you can receive power from on high to live for him. If that's you this morning, I I invite you to come as we sing our last song. 